facilitator. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Circle of Caring. And this afternoon, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Howard Butcher. He is professor and director of the PhD program at FAU Christine Lynn College of Nursing. Howard is a unitary caring scientist, and we are fortunate to have Howard with us here at FAU from the University of Iowa, where he was and is a specialist in NANDA and Nick and Nock, which he told me he's going to share a little bit about as well. I've known Howard for, I think it's almost 30 years that we've known each other. And um, I've always been impressed with his uh, presentations and certainly his publications. And um, so Howard uh, today will be presenting on um, research and research methodologies and certainly uh, associated with uh, caring science and unitary caring science. So I present to you, Dr. Howard Butcher. Thank you, Howard. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dee. And thank you um, for inviting me to do this. Um, and I really appreciate it. Um, you gave me this huge topic. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to share my screen so you can see the, the title that I was um, asked to speak on, um, which was this idea of research and scholarship grounded in caring science. And I thought, wow, what am I going to, you know, what can I say about that? There's, that's a, opens it up for a lot of possibilities. So, um, so I decided to address this in two ways. Um, I wanted to offer the audience, you guys, um, two models or methods that are grounded in caring that can advance caring science um, and as well caring practice. So the first, the first thing I want to talk about is a method that I developed that's going to be coming out in Nursing Science Quarterly in the next issue. And it's called the Unitary Caring Hermeneutic Phenomenological Method. And um, there are already, uh, there's already one publication that'll be in the same issue with the, with the method. So there's an there's a article on the method that lays out what the method is, which I'll describe. And then there's gonna be another publication that I co-authored with an FAU student who used the method in a research study. And I'm gonna give that as an example. And then there are already two other uh, doctoral students that are using this method in their dissertations. I'm on their committee and they already started, they reached out to me because they wanted to um, use a method that they felt was consistent with caring science. Uh, so that's exciting that there's gonna be, there's already gonna be three, so there's three studies right now. And by the way, that doctoral student who, whose article is being published alongside of the method, um, She's that, that study that she did was not her dissertation, that was a pilot. And so her dissertation is also using the method. So that really is then the fourth um, uh, study already with this method. Um, then the other thing I wanted to talk about was, um, which is gonna be the first time I'm gonna put this out for public critique, uh, but it has been accepted for presentation at the, um, International Association of Human Caring Conference coming up. So I'm gonna be, uh, you're, well, you're gonna be the first to see it. I'm calling it the Nursing as Caring Praxis Model. It's specific to Nursing as Caring by Boykin and Schoenhofer. And there's nothing more stressful than presenting a model with the two founders and theorists to see whether or not I'm actually, um, this Praxis Model is actually consistent with the theory. Um, so I have to tell a story about that. There was a, I, this, I learned this story when I was um, a, a PhD student, actually. Uh, there was a student who was presenting her dissertation out in California at a theory conference. And um, a very prominent person was the chair of her committee. I won't mention her name though, but I'm telling you, she was very prominent. And, um, and Martha was in the audience sitting in the back row 
And so this person presented her findings and when she was done and opened it up for questions, uh, Martha was like the first one to have her hand up. And she said, you know, that was a, just a beautiful, wonderful pre presentation grounded in the, you know, you know, about critical care patients and all this sort of stuff. She said, but you know, I don't know whose theory you were using. <laughs> she was supposed to be using the science of unitary human beings and she's sitting out there in the audience and they're the person saying, well, I don't really think you really use the, the theory appropriately. But that, that sort of like taught me a lesson that I always, that has been a guiding principle of all my work that I really strive to make sure that it is consistent with the work that's out there and especially with the theorists. Um, but you don't know that until you get critiqued from them, right? So, um, so I'm going to be putting this out there. Um, and uh, I see this as a model for both teaching, nursing um, process. I don't want to use that word, but what we would call the process of nursing, as well as being used in pra practice. So I'm going to give you a little glimpse of the outcomes here. So this is the outcome of the um, unitary caring human erotic phenomenological method, which is grounded in unitary caring science. So I'm saying that this method is specific to uh, one who's using either unitary caring theory by Smith or Watson's um, unitary caring science. And this was from the study um, that was done by Seaham. And it was this hermeneutic phenomenological study. And you can see that around in the middle, well, in the middle is the, um, is the essence of what the experience was. And then you have the themes linked to Ooh. theoretical concepts around the outside. So uh, I'm gonna explain how you use this method and how you come up with something that's like this, that actually builds, builds theoretical knowledge grounded in caring science. So we're gonna talk about that first, and then I'm gonna present the nursing as caring praxis model. And I probably, um, you know, I pro I'm worried that I'm not gonna have time to do both of these things, but, um, but as you can see, this model um, includes concepts that come right from caring as nursing. Um, but I wanna describe how this model works why it's distinctly different from the nursing process. And, um, and, and, and I think it's also an opportunity for also developing uh, more research as well. So these are the both of the end products of the two things I wanna talk about, the method, a research method, and a practice method, all um, grounded in um, caring science. So I thought I'd start off with some principles that guide my work in general, guided this specific work. These are uh, my beliefs. Um, I believe, as well as many others and people that are here, that knowledge is built in discipline through discipline-specific research. So if you're using, if you're using um, theoretical knowledge that comes from outside the discipline, from my perspective, uh, in other words, other conceptual frameworks that are not nursing conceptual frameworks, accent nursing theories, then you're not building nursing science. Um, and uh, one of the reasons why I'm here at FAU is because um, the expectation that doctoral students here uh, build nursing science. And so that their research, their dissertations are grounded in a caring science perspective. How that happens can, happen in multiple ways. Um, and I'll talk about some of those other, other possibilities besides this method. Discipline specific method is grounded in extant theory, theory. So that's nursing conceptual frameworks. Disciplines are not only characterized by their unique body of knowledge, but also by discipline specific research methods. So um, this is something that is not um, discussed a lot. Uh, I know Dr. Ray has uh, talked about this. But Watson and Boykin and Schoenhofer have both advocated for the development of methods that are specific to their theories. And certainly Parsi has done that, um, as well as Newman, um, and so has Leidinger, who has ethno-nursing. And so these are methods that are 
uh, that are really um, uh, are extensions, epistemological extensions of their conceptual frameworks. And I have done that same work with the science of unitary human beings. So in my dissertation, I developed the unitary field pattern portrait method, which I used in my dissertation that was derived in a specific to Rogerian science. And I also developed the practice method um, that is consistent with Rogerian science too, because I think that our practice methods need to flow from our theories as well. And that is true with the work of Roy and the work of Orm. They also have developed practice methods as well. Um, the work, uh, all research is guided by theory, whether implicitly or explicitly identified. So although we see many publications, maybe the mass majority of them in nursing that do not identify a conceptual framework, there is a conceptual framework there, even if it's not um, and not even if it's not explicitly identified. And unfortunately, in many cases, it's not grounded in nursing science or philosophy. Um, and so then from my perspective, they're not building nursing science knowledge. The work of scholars within the discipline <clears throat> includes the development and testing of discipline specific theories and methods. That's what we do as scholars and our stewards of the profession. And methods are developed in, in harmony with the ontology and epistemological connections. So I don't, so, methods need to be consistent with the assumptions that are grounded in the conceptual framework that is guiding the research. And um, so um, her, all her, and I also, so now I'm getting into some of the debatable, more controversial points, but these are my beliefs, that um, all phenomenological and hermeneutic methods are theory laden. Um, that includes methods that are so-called descriptive phenomenological methods that, uh, uh, claim that bracketing occurs. Um, and I'll talk more about that later. Uh, it's not that I'm saying that bracketing can occur. Those descriptive phenomenological methods are actually grounded in the discipline of psychology. And, uh, and you know, when you look a little closer to the work of Georgie, Van Manen, Kalanzi, and all of them, when they describe their methods, they even talk about transforming the language of the participants into the language of psychology. And so when we use those methods in nursing, borrow those methods in nursing, um, and we don't connect the, our themes to um, uh, extant nursing conceptual frameworks, and in our case, caring theories, then we're not really developing nursing knowledge. We're just describing an experience and not building theoretical knowledge that guides the discipline. That, language is actually grounded in existential existentialism or, or, or psychology. So I don't think that, so I, I don't agree with the use of those descriptive phenomenological methods without an interpretive frame and connecting them to nursing caring frameworks or nursing theory. Um, and that's what that next point talks about. So-called descriptive phenomenological methods are grounded in the epistemology language of psychology. Uh, if you want to read and learn more about that, um, Paley, Paley's book on phenomenology is a good place to start because he, he actually critiques and looks at um, George, um, uh, particularly Georgie's method and Van Manen and shows how those methods are grounded in psychology and not in uh, not nursing. Um, the development of congruent methodological puzzle making strategies involves examining then ontological assumptions and identifying epistemological met metaphors, which is how I went about the process of developing this method that's specific to unitary caring science. So um, I, I think maybe I want to say a few things before I jump into the specifics of this method. Um, there are other ways since I've been here that I've been mentioning or talking about or even guiding students in developing knowledge that's grounded in caring science. For example, um, in the comp exams, I have worked with students where I've talked about, you know, why don't you use, you know, so you're doing a, a integrative review, integrative systematic review. Why aren't integrative systematic reviews grounded and guided by a conceptual framework? Um, many of the almost exclusively systematic reviews and integrative reviews are done void of any kind of conceptualization grounded in nursing. Um, and what I suggested they use is the CTE -C -T -E framework by Fawcett, where in her latest book, she actually talks about 
how the E, the empirical indicator in the CTE framework is the, is the uh, review itself. But you, 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 the, the concepts within the conceptual framework, the C and the theory are what actually structure the review itself. And so um, you are then building um, the review of the literature grounded in a nursing conceptual framework. So that, that's another way that we could be building um, nursing um, caring science knowledge through the kinds of reviews we're doing and making them grounded in, in, our, in our science, our caring science. When we talk, you know, I'm gonna be talking about a qualitative method, but when it comes to quantitative research, to me, um, you know, you can use a mid-range theory. Um, and in many cases in the quantitative research studies, you need a mid-range theory to describe those processes. But those, those, those mid-range theories, if we're gonna be building caring science, need to be connected to the larger grand theory whether it's Watson or Boykin, Shonoff or whatever, but the, the mid-range theory needs to be reformulated within the context of the caring theory. And that means defining the, the quote variables within a caring science perspective. So the conceptual definitions in the research need to be grounded in caring science and not simply using the definitions that come from some other theoretical perspective. So this reconceptualizing, this connecting to the, to the conceptual framework from the beginning um, is another way of building caring nursing science. So I'm gonna throw those two things out there. Those are, those are two other presentations by themselves to talk about how to go about doing that. So um, I'm gonna just go through this very quickly. I'm gonna share these slides. Um, this is the process that I use to build the method. So I. So um, I'm gonna flip back actually. So I use Gordon's framework um, for developing the methodology to make sure that the method is congruent with ont ontological and epistemological assumptions. So that means examining the ontology, examining the epistemology, and then developing the methodology in congruence with that. That is exactly the same thing I did when I, in my dissertation when I developed the unitary field pattern portrait method in relationship to Rogerian science. I did this analysis in regard to unitary caring science. So this is the um, articulation or, the, um, or what the unitary um, caring ontology is, which is grounded in the work of Watson and Smith. So these are their words from their publication in 2002. And this extended, th this is an articulation of that ontology, which is a synthesis of the unitary perspective grounded in Rogerian science with caring science, especially Watson. So, you know, I could go through and explain one, each one of these things, but that's that's then we're not going to get to anything. Okay, that's another presentation by itself. But those are the that's the ontology. Okay, it's grounded in the unitary transformative paradigm, and there, I, know, I think I think I'll stop at that. Then this is the epistemology. I do want to point out um, the unitary caring epistemology that it, that it uses multiple modes of awareness. So if you're gonna do this from a, you know, if you're gonna uh, incorporate this in a method, then that means that the ways of knowing include all these ways of knowing in terms of gathering information about the caring experience. That's moral, ethical, personal, empirical, emancipatory, indigenous, ancestral, unitary aesthetic, tacit, intuition, mystical, pan-dimensional ways of knowing, spiritual ways of knowing, loving and compassionate ways of knowing, symbolic, um, I think I've mystical maybe twice, mystical, unknowing, and synoptic. So, um, and I, sh I should also show you, so I actually have the, the proof of the, of the article and all this <laughs> is in that article, but this is what the um, epistemology from the unitary care perspective is. Uh, you're looking at pattern and pattern can't be broken into parts that merge from the hum human environmental field. So when I did this with Rogers, um, I looked for what Morgan talks about as epistemological metaphors that are embedded within the framework uh, within Rogers. And I came up with two from her writings and that was kaleidoscope because she talks about how all pattern, all information is like a kaleidoscope. 
that of continuously changing in unpredictable ways and manifesting dynamically. And the other word or metaphor that she uses in her writings when she talks about knowledge, which is epistemology, um, is the idea of symphony and how everything is in a, it emerges a rhythmically. So I wanted to identify a, um, a metaphor that captures unitary caring science from the writings of Watson in particular. And, um, you know, it really wasn't hard to discover what that metaphor was. It's love. The, the idea of love is so deeply embedded within Watson's caring perspective, not just when she talks about compassion, but she talks about loving presence, loving kindness. She, her work is grounded ethically in the work of Levianus, who talks about um, a, 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 a universe of love and compassion. And, um, and so to me, the, metaphor, the epistemological metaphor of unitary caring science and perhaps all of caring science is the idea of love. And I, I know that that, work, that that word is also embedded within the work of Boykin and Schoenhofer. So these are the things that I needed to make sure reflected in the methodology because the methodology is derived from this epistemology, this ontology, and this idea of, of love. So the focus of the method is on understanding human experiences from a unitary caring nursing perspective. And I just listed here a lot of possibilities on what a research study using this method could focus on. Experiences from these kinds of caring practices that are um, unitary in the sense that they're not particularistic and, um, but you can look at any, any, um, any kind of experience and conceptualize it from a unitary perspective. But these in particular are things that are rich for, for research. Um, I'm working with a student right now who, uh, who did a study from a unitary perspective on, uh, on coaching. And so, um, you know, Watson has a lot of information about, uh, you know, you can get certified from uh, from Caritas coaching um, as uh, you know within Watson science, but um, but I remember something that Richard I learned from my dissertation here, Richard that you know it, any information any experience can be uh, can be a focus of research. It's conceptualizing it from a nursing perspective or conceptualizing it from a unitary perspective. So if you're looking at something like as physiological as blood pressure. You know, if you're looking at that from a unitary perspective, a blood pressure is a reflection of the human environmental mutual process that is pan-dimensional and is not a part. So you're not just looking at it as a physiological measure, but an indicator indice of the entire energy field. So it's how you conceptualize things. And that's, and that's what has to be done in this research is you conceptualize your quote variables within a unitary perspective so that it's not grounded in some other science. So another uh, key part of this uh, method is that um, in terms of when you do in a hermeneutic phenomenological, phenomenological method, the text or the person's story and their experiences is the data, is the, what you're looking at for the themes. And, but in the, in the gathering of that, that, all ways of knowing. So all these ways of knowing, you need to be open to all these possibilities and ways of knowing when you're listening to the person's story and gathering information about the nature of their, of their um, experience. I should put this actually on uh, presentation mode so I don't have to keep on um, going to the side. So here then are the steps. There's a table in the article. Um, these steps pretty much follow a, 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 a hermeneutic phenomenological method. We're using purposeful sampling. You're uh, uh, gathering information about pattern manifestations, but you're using all ways of knowing. The, the interviews are somehow taped or videotaped or whatever, so you have the data. Then they're transcribed and you read to try to gra grasp a sense of the whole. So th that's pretty much traditional. Um, by the way, so the, 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 the steps of this method, in as early as 1980, 
85, Watson laid out steps for a hermeneutic phenomenological method in her 1985 book um, towards the back. And I basically started with that process, which was grounded in phenomenological methods at the, at the time. But she talks about how nursing needs to extend those methods that are grounded in psychology, extend them. But nobody has really done that other than, Mar than, than Marilyn Ray um, with her aesthetic knowing her aesthetic method. And Marilyn, maybe there's a chance that you can talk about that. But there's very few examples out there of methods in the caring science field that are grounded and extend from the conceptual framework. And that's what I tried to do here. So uh, Watson talks about identifying meaning units. I, you know, it clearly comes from Georgie. And then you, know, you synthesize those um, using um, imaginative, artistic, inspired, metaphor, poetic insights and looking at the, at, at the data to come up with new understandings of the meaning, the capper and essence of the meaning of the, experience, of the experience. And so that's how you identify your essences or themes. Here's where the method kind of takes an extension, extension from the traditional ways of doing phenomenology that are grounded in psychology. Um, you construct what I call a synthetic statement. Now, Parsi does something similar. I do something similar in the unitary caring pattern method, where you combine the themes into a statement that captures, that shows the relationship between the themes and captures um, what the meaning of the experience is. An addition is the idea of including a metaphor or some sort of aesthetic rendition of what that experience is. And I'll show you what that was in Seaham's study. Um, I got that idea because here at FAU, that's something that's done in a lot of the courses. Um, you know, I'm teaching 60, 6110, and students identify a metaphor um, that, that captures the essence and art artistically the essence of the nursing situation. So here I'm just putting that within a re research context. And then number 10 really is where it goes off into its unique science, nursing science perspective. And I'm calling that in this method, interpretive theorizing. And this is what I, you know, to be critical, this is what I don't see happening here at FAU with the dissertations. As those that are qualitative, descriptive, phenomenological, they use the method, whether it's Husserl, Georgie, Van Manen, they're using flowers, Smith and Flowers method. They do the, they, they uh, identify the themes and then they, that's it. You have a list of themes and there's no, there's no, there's no connection to nursing science unless those themes are interpreted and given conceptual meaning from the conceptual framework. And that is done by connecting the themes to the concepts in the theory. Just as in quantitative research, you would connect the variables to concepts within the caring theory and then define them conceptually within the theory. And then last step of the, of the, of the, um, of the method is to present the findings as a visual representation illuminating the relationships between the essences linked to the theory concepts, which is that diagram that I showed you um, with the circle. So that's the method. Um, a question that, that, that I know that, that I've already been asked by some students. So I asked, uh, you know, I developed this method because I was gonna publish it. And I wanted to make sure that it was consistent with the ontology and the epistemology. And I know that this idea of the relationship between the knower and the and the look and the knower and the and the looked into is integral, which allows you to make this sort of theoretical interpretation. Um, the question is: Is can you use other th caring theories besides Smith and Watson within this framework? And I will say yes, but you just have to make you have just to explain how you're doing that. Okay, to make sure that it's consistent with this method. And I would say, yes, I was having a conversation, I hope we have time for this, with Savina and Anne on, on, another, on another forum. Um, and I think that Anne said, I don't see anything inconsistent 
um, we were talking about the specific method, but she didn't say there was she didn't say there was anything inconsistent that would allow for this kind of interpretation. But we we can talk more about that. So, so so this is the interpretive theory. I just kind of want to highlight that again. So. Um, if you're using Boykin and Schoenhofer, then the question is, is can you connect them to the concepts in Boykin and Schoenhofer's theory? That I think is, a, I would need to hear that kind of endorsement from Savina and from Anne. Um, but I know that from the work that I did, certainly with Smith and Watson, that you would be connecting it to those caring so concepts. So this is what I put down here, is that within Smith's theory, you would be connecting those themes to her concepts of manifesting intentions, appreciating pattern, attuning to dynamic flow. She has five major concepts, experiencing the infinite and inviting creative emergence. And then within Watson's theory, you would connect those themes to concepts such as transpersonal caring, relational caring, for other belonging, caring conscious, the, the 10 uh, characters processes. You, know, you would be connecting to those kinds of concepts within her theory. Uh, I do want to say that that this is an example of how you reconceptualize and reinterpret things. So typically in quanti qualitative studies, they talk about saturation. Um, from a unitary perspective, and language is important, saturation is not possible because the field is always emerging, always unpredictable. There's always new information coming. So saturation is not the right word. But patterns do repeat, okay? Patterns do repeat and the repetition of patterns is something that is a way of rethinking or rephrasing the idea of when you reach a point where you have redundancy of pattern and so then you don't need to collect any more information so so i didn't use the word saturation in this method i use the word pattern rep repetition and then in terms of scientific rigor using Gubin and Lincoln's criteria are fine they're pretty universal but there's some additional criteria that needs to be looked at um, that I've included in this. And that is the idea of descriptive vividness, asking whether or not the aesthetic and the metaphor, uh, the, the, the metaphor and the aesthetic rendition embraces universal qualities of, of, of the phenomenon. And then what I would call unitary integrity, do caring scholars view the conceptual representation of phenomena as coherent and consistent and meaningful when the in the, in the context of unitary caring theory. So, in Seaham's study, she looked at um, the experience of stroke, persons who have experienced a stroke that are still in the hospital uh, receiving care. And she was looking at the experience, the caregiver's experience in caring for a, their, their the care recipient who's experienced a stroke. And so I asked her if she could come up with a, a, met, uh, a visual aesthetic rendition of what, of, of what the uh, experience was in terms of caring. And she sees these hands um, both as praying hands and as well as hands of caring um, as a family member is um, embracing their family member who's going through this process. And every study would have, it's whatever the researcher you know, would come up with. So, so here's where I wanted to show. So this was the final product using this method in, in this particular study. So you, what you see here, so she used Smith's, she used Smith's um, a unitary caring theory. And you can see the, in the middle, read that first. Those are her themes. She identified these themes. Um, and we, she and I together synthesized those into a synthetic statement to, ingrate, to capture the essence of the experience we did tweak this a little bit from this slide. We took out one of the wiles. I thought a while was a little bit repetition, but I'll read it. Living with an, the experience of caring for a family member with a stroke in the hospital is living with the uncertainty of ambiguity, amb ambiguity while feeling the stress with worries and fears, replete with unfulfilled desires while yearning for compassionate caring and overcoming uncertainty through connections and faith while honoring abiding, abiding commitments. And in the study, it shows how, you know, that you have quotes that support each of the themes, how the themes were created. So all that is shown, but this is what you end up at the end. And then you take those themes that she identified and you connect them to concepts within the theory. And that's what you see around the outside. So unfulfilled desires are apprehended by appreciating pattern. What's in italics is the, is the concept. 
manifesting intentions is honoring a Biden commitments. So these are then become like propositional statements. Overcoming uncertainties through connections and faith is experiencing the infinite. Inviting creative emergence is yearning, is the process of yearning for compassionate caring and attuning to dynamic flow is living with the uncertainty of ambig ambiguity in the midst of feeling distressed with fears and worries. So every study that you would use this method guided by a caring theory will come up with some sort of theoretical description or rendition of what that experience is from that theoretical perspective. Now I'm going to switch gears. Um, I do, I, this is, I'm really excited about this. Um, I'm pretty confident about the method, <laughs> but I'm not sure about this, but this is going to be new to all of you. And I'm going to, I'm going to be really pushing the envelope here. Okay. Um, I'm not sure. I, I know that as I'm, well, I better, I better not say I know for sure, but I don't think the faculty at FAU are familiar with this clinical reasoning model. And I have been working with this model for 20 years. Pasek and Herman were teachers of mine when I was doing my PhD in 1994. They hadn't developed the OPT model yet, but they were talking about it. In 1999, the OPT model came out in that text that's brown on the left-hand side, Clinical Reasoning, the Art and Science of Critical and Creative Thinking. And then the second edition of that book is the other one here, came out about three years ago, The Essentials of Clinical Reasoning for Nurses, using the OPT model, which is the Outcome Present State Model for Reflective Practice. I've included this model in every edition of the Nick textbook that has come out. And I have moved beyond with this. This transcends the nursing process. The nursing process is outdated. Outdated. It doesn't fit. And I'm going to explain why. <laughs> this is what the OPT model looks like. It is nothing like the nursing process. So it is a nonlinear process. All of these processes happen simultaneously. The nursing process is a linear sequential process. This also is grounded in outcomes. You, for just for a moment, all of you, you need to just put aside your caring science model and perspective for a moment, okay? I know your mind, you're already gonna be thinking about how does this, how does this fit with, with the caring science model of Boykin and Schoenhofer? Just put that as, I'm just describing the OPT model right now. It is atheoretical. This, what I'm showing you is atheoretical. It is a, as atheoretical as the nursing process is atheoretical. There's no theory in here yet. I'm going to reconceptualize this within caring science. That's going to be the next step. But let me, I need to explain what is in the OPT to begin with, though, first. So it is grounded in narrative because it starts, although it's a nonlinear process, with the, nurse, with the story in context, the person's story. It's not an assessment, it's listening to the story. And you're always listening to the story. This is, like I said, all these processes are simultaneous. While you're listening to the story, you're listening for cues. And that's what cue logic is. The cues are the listening for the signs and symptoms and the indicators and the things that indicate there's something that needs to be addressed. When you identify, it's all about trying to identify what the present state is. So what is the present state of the nursing situation? That's your diagnosis. And then as you're thinking about what the present state is, you're already thinking about where do we need to go? What does this patient need? What are the outcomes that this person needs to move to? Framing is the conceptual framework. So everything is conceptualized within some sort of frame. Now you can conceptualize this within a biomedical model if you want to wish, but then you're not practicing nursing. 
framing could be Roy's framework or Orm's framework. Or in the case that I'm going to explain next, nursing is caring can serve as the framework. And then that transforms these concepts and what they mean. But the outcome state reflects <laughs> where the person needs to go. Testing. Hey, Malcolm, is I'm on a, uh, a uh, Zoom meeting, but listen, I, when I called South Arts this morning, <laughs> I found way. out Texas is not one of the states we can draw on. So I'm working to see if we can get Dorothy. Okay, all right, well, just let me know. I'll call you back after I get off of the Zoom meeting. Okay, good enough. Thank, Thank you. you, bye. Right. I don't want Sabina to miss any of this. <laughs> That's why I held off, not because I want to hear the conversation. Okay, testing is the nurse thinking about whether or not the ideas to move the person from the peasant state and outcome state would work or not. So it's grand, it's like the evidence-based practice sort of thinking about is this, you know, is and is it working? Is it working? So framing is putting it all within the nursing conceptual framework. Reflection is going on all the time. It's always thinking about, it's based on Don. It, so this is my, I've extended the use of this model. I've included narrative and reflective practice. So reflection from my perspective, not from Dan's perspective, because he doesn't articulate this out in detail enough, but reflection for me is grounded in the work of, of, of Johns and Freshwater, the idea of reflecting on action, thinking about what you're doing while you're doing it. And that nurses should be doing that all the time. They're always thinking about doing what they're doing while they're doing it. Decision-making is the choices of interventions Remember, we're not talking about caring science yet. The interventions that are going to move the person from the present state to the outcome state. And judgment then is the evaluation of whether or not the outcomes have been achieved or not. And when they are achieved, then you exit the system. So that is the OPT model. It's not nursing process because there's no assessment in the traditional sense of assessment. It includes a theoretical perspective. It is grounded in reflection. It's not, and it's non-linear. Actually, the next slide shows it. It's non-linear. There's an emphasis on outcomes. It incorporates story or narrative nursing. It uses reflective practice. It includes a disciplinary lens, which is not part of the nursing process. Oh, I did mention that it also incorporates what is called a clinical reasoning web. And for me, it's grounded in the languages of Nanda, Nick, and Knott. And I'll show you how I'm gonna do that in a way that I believe is consistent with caring science. So the clinical reasoning web is that one of the, that when you are doing this, um, let me go back a slide. So when, when you are trying, when you're doing the Q logic and you're sort of like putting together the present state, you can do what is called a clinical reasoning web where you look at, what are the major problems or nursing diagnoses in this situation, okay? And then you look at what are the relationships between the different problems, and then you can identify what is the key, the key or keystone problem that really is the one that needs to be addressed first. So Maslow's hierarchy of needs doesn't really work, okay, because Sometimes it might be a spiritual thing that's really going on is really the primary issue when you look at the clinical reasoning web. And that's what really needs to be addressed first because everything else flows from that. So it becomes non, the clinical, the clinical reasoning web is non-hierarchical and is not grounded in some sort of predetermined level of what is more important than other from a holistic perspective. So, that is the model as it's presented in the textbook. Now, now we go for the transformation. I just, I wanted to put this slide up here because what the work that I've done with this model, which Dan has not done, was I, I draw into the OPT narrative, caring science, reflective practice, and standardized nursing languages. So all of that comes together. So here are the main concepts that we have in nursing as caring. The nursing situation, the caring in between. I have the six C's, the caring ingredients in there, the direct invitation, listening to the story, understanding the call for nursing, using multiple ways of knowing, 
knowing, apprehending patterns, interpreting meanings. I don't think that that's listed as a concept, but it's part of the process of, of listening for the call, reflecting um, the present situation. Um, oh, I, I changed some of these things already. Um, the dance of caring, the responses to calls and transforming patterns of living and growing and caring. So I put that back up there. Now I wanna show you this. <laughs> so what I've done that now is stay true to the OPT model because it is a process of reasoning to come up with sound caring responses so that we achieve sound um, enhanced personhood. So I've put the language, we wanna flip back and forth, the language of caring science of where it fits within the OPT model. So the listening to the story in context becomes to me, the invitation and listening to the story. So the whole thing is the nursing situation, right? Because the whole thing is the shared living experience in which caring between the nurse and the nurse enhances, per, enhances professionhood. That's the whole of this process. And so the nursing is created by the in-between. So the direct invitation is listening to the other story. And here we are offering nursing, right? We're inviting one who is nursed to share what matters to them most we're listening to the story, listening for calls, using our ways, all those ways of knowing and being authentically and genuinely present. And so the cue logic becomes recognizing the calls for nursing. Cue logic before is where you're, um, uh, how do I move back and forth? <laughs> I don't know, but maybe I have to do it here. I don't know, I can't move backwards, it seems. Okay, so you're recognizing calls for nursing is what the cue logic is. And so that, that's based on all your ways of knowing, right? What, what you know, empirical, what are, what, are the, what are the concerns the patient has? You know, maybe they're, they're, they're tanking with their blood pressure and you, know, and there's, you need to respond to that. But, you're listening for all the different calls of nursing. All the while you're reflecting about what you're doing while you're doing it. So recognizing calls and their calls for nurturance as the lived, um, as the lived, um, in, the, in the lived experience, right? And it's also coming to know the person as persons and choosing to understand the meaning of the situation to them. All of that is also part of recognizing calls. It's not just about identifying problems, it's coming to know the person. The cause for nursing then is where you um, identify what, what are the, what is the situation that you need to really respond to as a nurse? And that could be represented as a narrative, it's a synthesis, uh, it's a profile, um, you know, it's your, you know, it's where you identify by what the issue is, but the NANDA diagnoses would be part of that. Not all of it, but part of that. If we're gonna be using classification language and I can go through a whole thing on why it's essential that we use standardized languages. If we don't use standardized languages, we can't communicate to one another. And we can't do research and, and be able to, uh, if we're not speaking the same language, everybody's calling the same thing, something different. We're never gonna be able to consolidate data okay, of any kind. So, but that's a whole other argument. You know, I've had 30 years of experience working with classification languages. The, the outcome is enhanced personhood, okay? That's what the outcome of this, uh, uh, we don't wanna call it an outcome. It's not an outcome in the traditional sense of an outcome, but that's what our nursing care is reaching for, for the person to experience enhanced personhood. How do we know? One way we know, how do we know that we're reaching that is by looking at whether or not they've achieved outcomes, knock outcomes, based on the standard languages of knock. The, the caring in between is that process of, of working together 
Um, well, let me talk about enhanced personhood too. So that's thinking about and identifying the changes, the goals, the outcomes to be achieved that foster wholeness, humanization, health, well-being, well-becoming, quality of life, safety, and justice. Those are all aspects of personhood. Um, um, the caring in between is, the, is where the intention to care, because this is the negotiation process going on between moving the person from the calls for nursing to the enhanced, enhanced uh, personhood. There's loving relationships that is a loving relationship that's occurring in the caring in between, and it's a reciprocal exchange. Um, and then reflection that I have up top there is this idea of always using um, thinking about what you're doing while you're doing it. So you asking questions like, what is going on here? Is there a better way to achieve or to enhance this person's betterhood than the, than the processes that I'm choosing? Um, who is this person? What is the information that I need? How can I help, how can I help nurture this person's personhood? Always asking yourself those questions while you're doing it. The, the, the decision-making, are the caring, creating caring responses, okay? So that's the response and the response is what we do. And for me, that's informed by the NIC intervention classification system. So that all 614 interventions, we're not calling them interventions, but conceptually within this model, all those things that we do are caring responses for nurturing personhood. That's what the interventions are. We don't have to use the language of intervention. We use the event language of caring, creating caring responses. But you can still use the NIC to inform what those caring responses can be. So it's, so it's the same thing with, with, with any concept. You conceptualize NAND and NIC and NOC in a way that's consistent with the theoretical framework that's guiding your practice. So, so NOC becomes indicators of enhanced personhood and interventions become creating caring are the caring responses and then at the end the um the judgment is sharing growth through caring which then is this idea of you know looking at are and how well are the person meeting those um those indicators of of enhanced professionhood and those could be informed by the knock indicators and then the exit i didn't like the word exit to me, the exit of, from nursing is living grounded and caring according to the theory, but I was thinking that it really is leaving this dance, leaving this dance of caring, which is why I have the dance of caring superimposed on the background, to entering another dance, another dance in some other aspect of life that is not maybe health related, but we're always in dances. So it's just leaving this dance into another dance, but leaving, living grounded and caring. So that, that, that is the model as I have reformulated it within caring science. And um, for some reason, I can't even advance these slides. I'm gonna, mm -hmm. I'm gonna go back to see if I, if I can share a screen again. Okay, so here are the, the textbooks then that, that provide the language the content, not the theory and the philosophy, the language and the content that informs this practice model, just like this can be used and is used within the nursing process, nursing diagnosis, nursing interventions, and nursing outcomes. This is an example of what a NIC intervention looks like. So this within a theore our theoretical perspective, okay, this is a caring response on the part of the nurse. So you have the label, the definition, and the activities, and there's 614 of these that cut across all specialty areas, all settings, and we, rev we revise this. We're just getting ready to submit the um, eighth edition to Elsevier, and we've added another uh, 60 new interventions to it. But we also change labels, change definitions, update, um, update the activities. And then this is what a knock outcome looks like. This is the knock outcome for caregiver health. And you see that there's indices and you could rate them along the stigmatic differential 
scale. You can evaluate them at different points of time and to see whether or not they're achieving their personhood because this would be conceptualized as personhood, as an indicator of personhood within this theory conceptually. That, that is my, I'm putting it out there. So I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm presenting this at, uh, I want to say that I have been presenting the OPT model for years internationally, all around the world. Mm -hmm. um, the last place was Denmark, um, and uh, a lot of presentations in Colombia and Mexico. I'm always talk. I can't talk about Nana, Nick, and Nock without talking about how it guides the process of caring. So what's different since I came to FAU now is when I present this model, I put it into the conceptual framework. Not, not this, not the one that you just saw, but a conceptual framework. I could do that with Roy, Orm, King, Peplo. You could use the OPT with any kind of conceptual framework, okay? But what you just saw was the first, my first attempt in linking it to caring science, uh, particularly caring as nursing. I could do the same thing with Watson's theory. But um, I think thinking ahead is possible, but I'm not sure I want to do this. I like the OPT model. I like its structure. It makes sense to me. I think that we could develop here at FAU or within the caring as nursing our own, our own um, model that shows the relationships within these concepts that enhance and how we use our knowledge to enhance personhood. But right now I'm at the place where I don't think we need to do that because I think the OPT model does that. It does it on an established framework that's already out in the literature that's been out there since 1999. When, when Pasek and Herman talk about the OPT, they critique the nursing process and they talk about this as the third generation of nursing process, that this is the future. We need to move away from the linear sequential uh, causal way of thinking. And I have presented the OPT nursing model to practicing nurses in critical care units in, around the world. And when I tell them, when I offer this model to them and I say, tell me whether or not you think this model better reflects the way you think and practice, or do you use the nursing process? of assessment, planning, you know, nursing diagnosis. And they all say universally, this model makes more sense to them because they don't break things down into those steps. This is a process where you could be looking at the outcomes simultaneously as you're listening to the story. It's all, it's all nonlinear happening all at once, but the way to describe it of course, I just described it in a linear way. It doesn't work in a linear way. I'm gonna shut up now because I, I am dying to hear oh, what you think. You have a sip of water. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Howard, for this amazing scholarly presentation. And uh, so I'm going to open it up for questions. And of course, as you know, you have uh, enhanced uh, doctors Boykin and Shonifer's theory within your presentation as well. So of course they're on this call and so I invite them, but I uh, also invite others uh, and even uh, hopefully doctoral students who may be on who have been a part of your uh, teaching and learning processes uh, in the doctoral program. And, and uh, so I open this up now uh, to um, uh, questions for our guest speaker, Dr. Butcher. I do want to add that there are schools of nursing around the U.S. that I know of, and there's research out there on the OPT model, not grounded in any particular theory, but using the OPT model and how it has enhanced the teaching of clinical reasoning and the accuracy of making nursing diagnoses. And at Iowa, we scrapped in the undergraduate program, the teaching of the nursing process. They learn the OPT model. Mm -hmm. Wow. And it's not, you know, so you, you say that, okay, well, the a and &E has a standards of practice and it's based on the nursing process. Well, they're still doing all those things. We're mm -hmm. still teaching all those things, but 
the model that's used to teach clinical reasoning and decision making and it, that is used in clinical is the OPT model. I want to put the OPT model within the context. I, my work is around framing it within particular nursing theories because Dan in his textbook talks about, well, you can frame it within the DSM four or five now, or you can, or there's, a, there's actually another version of the textbook that's for advanced practice and it's framed within the biomedical model, which really made me mad that they did that but that's what they're using in the nurse practitioner and DMP programs, using the OPT, but using a medical framework. Mm -hmm. For me, it needs to be grounded in a nursing framework. And that's what, that's the way that I use it. And that's the way that I'm trying to make that connection. Because my vision is, what if here at FAU, this becomes the model for teaching clinical reasoning and teaching nursing care planning, whatever we want to call it in the undergraduate program, using caring as nursing, but within a clinical decision-making that's established, that is not the nursing process, but it's actually, it is the OPT model. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you, Howard. And I welcome questions now. Uh, and I know in the chat that uh, Dr. Shonifer has uh, uh, identified uh, concepts within the um, nursing as caring theory. So perhaps uh, would you like to begin, uh, Sabina Shonifer, uh, one of our nursing theorists? Well, Thank, thank you, Dee. And thank you, Howard. This is amazing. And I hope this is recorded and made yes, available. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> because it's way too much to take in. But um, just following up on what Howard just said, I wanted to uh, reiterate the point that just like <clears throat> almost any model that appears in the literature is grabbed up in nursing and used without any theoretical embeddedness, just what you're talking about, Howard. Mm -hmm. And that, and learning this model, you know, well, I know you've read nursing is caring and, and that was first published in 1993 and at that point we said nursing situation does i mean nursing process has no useful absolutely uh, place in nursing yeah. but what what using this good framework or any framework requires is what's the word uh internalizing a nursing theoretical framework. And I don't care what the heck it is. Um, you know, I started out with Orem and uh, shifted to Parsi and, and eventually came to nursing as caring. But um, that to me, that's the biggest challenge is having the faculty's commitment to thoroughly internalizing at least a nursing theoretical framework to um, provide the foundation for this OTC model. <coughs> We've got hours and hours of discussion to do, but we're not going to do that right now, but this was fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I just want to mention too, going back to, to the, the OPT model back in 1983, four, we, as a faculty at that time, small as we were, gave up nursing process. Sure. And that is why we moved toward story or nursing situations and using Patterson and Zerad. And then, and then trying to bring to it the uh, theoretical framework like Savina is talking about. But the issue has been and probably continues to be for faculty to be comfortable, not going back to what still exists in books, but rather take on a new framework that makes sense for practice. Mm -hmm. But Howard, I thought your presentation was awesome. I can't wait until you and till we can maybe have a little round robin discussion. <laughs> I am really excited. I've got a lot of little notes written. So um, yeah, it's very exciting. I think it's I'm proud 
that you're going to be presenting this at IHC. Um, so I look forward to talking with you more about this. One of the dialogues I really want, and Savina and I, start, Savina and I have been writing this out, but I, I would love to have a dialogue with you and Savina about, about standardized nursing languages, quite honestly. Um, because to me, I, I, I have a whole presentation on why it is absolutely essential that we use a language. I'm not talking about theoretical language, because to me, Nan and Nick and Nak are not theoretically grounded. They are labels for experiences and things. We can conceptualize them in multiple different ways, okay? So that within Roy's framework, a nursing intervention is a matter of responding to a stimulus or a control process that promotes adaptation. So there, there are techniques or strategies to promote adaptation. Within Roger's framework, there are unitary pattern modalities. They're not parts, but unitary pattern modalities. So the way you conceptualize them is what makes them nursing and theoretical. You still need to have a language that captures what it is that we're doing so we all can communicate with one another so that what you're calling caregiver support is the same thing as what they're calling it in Brazil and the same thing they're calling it over here. Otherwise, we won't be able to see and do research talking about the same thing of whether or not caregiver support actually does do something in terms of promoting from our perspective, personhood, from Roy's perspective, adaptation, from Orm's perspective, self-care. That doesn't, I, I, I don't really don't, well, I do care what framework people use. I mean, I'm grounded in caring science and Rogers, but the fact that they're using it within a different conceptual system that's nursing is a celebration to me. But we still need to be talking about the same thing to describe what we do, what we're looking at of what we're trying to accomplish and what we're calling what we're calling and what we're addressing, which is the diagnosis. But to us, it's not a diagnosis. So it doesn't matter. I think my struggle is um, the language when you say, well, what we do as nurses, you know, and you have that list of what we do, but that list is a, a list of what many different disciplines do, right? So to me, that's been my struggle. What is it that nursing does? What's the language for that? So well, anyway. Care, but caregiver support, yeah. So social workers do caregiver support. Other people do caregiver support. We're not saying that nurses are the only ones that do caregiver support, but we need to call it something. And, and and that we need to call it in a way, name it in a way that allows us to use it consistently across settings, across populations, across countries. You know, Nick has been translated into 12 different languages. So caregiver support has been translated into 12 different languages that are in the computer systems all around the world. And then we, so we can look into that and say, this is what this, this is what the nurse is doing here. This is what we're gonna call it. We can call it something else, but we need to come up with some sort of name for it. Otherwise, we just have local language. We just have local language. The, our language of what we call things, which is not understood outside our locality. We need a universal language. Um, but anyway, that's, that's, I have a whole other presentation about how, lang how language, nurse, language structures thought and creates culture. All languages create culture and culture then structures the way we think. So that's why it is so important about what our language is. And language is just not classification language, it's also theoretical language. It's also our theories and our conceptual frameworks and how we think about what it is we are doing from a philosophical and conceptual perspective. So that's language too. D, I'm wondering, 
since we don't have a presentation for next month, if Howard would be willing to do one on nursing. I need a break. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I mean, uh, yes, it's up, it's up to you, Howard, if you would like to carry on this scholarly discussion and, and uh, you know, entice more of our uh, faculty and students for, you know, dialogue with you about this. And because what was striking me within our discussion and where you were discussing this notion of uh, linear linearity and so I'm thinking you know with my background to a large extent too the idea of complexity science and dynamism you know yeah. that this process is dynamic and yeah. and it, it's always changing as a result of the relationship the interaction or the communication or the languaging that kind of thing you know it's not a static model and right and Pasek and Herman talk about different ways of thinking that guide the OPT and complexity and holistic thinking and systems thinking and meta thinking are all described as ways of thinking in using the OPT. So complexity is a way of thinking within this model. And it can capture all of those phenomena that you just communicated, right? You know, yes. you know, because you know, our consciousness is so complex. And when, you know, when you were presenting your model, you know, I have a friend now whose husband's in the hospital and and uh, had undergone brain surgery this morning. So I was trying to put myself in the framework of communicating with the spouse, you know, about uh, using the model that you uh, presented. And, uh, and then what, what I was responding to as a nurse and as a friend and, you know, that kind of thing. And so I found it very um, good, you know, from the point of view of where I, where I am in the process of um, being with another person who's undergoing a lot of stress and strain, you know, with uh, their spouse, you know, being hospitalized and in surgery, well, it just came out and I got a message that said he's doing okay. So that made me feel good. But, um, you know, you can use it in, you know, that model in so many different ways. Uh, I, I think, think, you know, what I'm saying is, you know, what we, I don't know what is happening at the undergraduate classes at FAU. I think they're using the nursing process. Hurley might know. Um, um, and then I don't, maybe they're making links of the traditional nursing process to nursing as caring. I'm not sure. There, I, I did run across a PowerPoint, an old, old PowerPoint that was developed by somebody, some faculty member at FAU um, that showed here's the nursing process in one column, you know, what diagnosis and assessment is. And here it is over here in the nursing as caring. But to me, it didn't really match. And of course, I'm already beyond the nursing process um, because, of, because of its linear aspects. I didn't think that it was very good. It's something better than just the nursing process. It is theoretically connected to nursing is caring, but it's not integrated in the way that I did it with OPT in a whole new way of thinking about how, how to enhance uh, profession. If you don't like Nan and Nick and Knock, it doesn't have to be part of this model. You could put something else in there. I put it there because I believe it needs to be in there, but it doesn't have to fit within this model that I just presented today. I think we should have a conversation of whether or not Nanda, Nick, and Nock offer something more in terms of helping students make clinical decisions and be able to see whether or not their clinical decisions are making a difference or not. We need something, I believe, to, to help them do that. And to me, I can't think of anything better than Nan and Nick and Nock, but we need something. But if you don't want it in there, it doesn't have to be in there. We can put medical diagnosis in there. I'm, I'm just saying that facetiously. Anything can go in there. It's the way that, it's the what I put in there that, that I believe what, what needs to be in there. Anyway. So. <laughs> you asked the question whether or not um, there was a link, you know, to nursing is caring in the undergraduate. And yeah. uh, Dr. Bertrand said, no, we are not doing this. 
you know, so, you know, there's... So, so right. So, so, and there's no reason to, well, there is a reason to, but the nursing process, because it doesn't, it doesn't have a place to put the conceptual framework. Mm -hmm. You know, the OPT has framing. The word framing is part of the process. So everything gets framed in some perspective. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, let's frame it within nursing and not medicine. Mm -hmm. Let's frame it within caring as nursing here at FAU. You know, so framing is in there. Reflection is in there. Narrative and story is in there. Mm -hmm. And I also am putting in there the importance of using a standardized language. But that, that that's another presentation, but that's, I'm a synthesizer, okay? You know, and I want you to know too, because I was at Roy's presentation yesterday, and I just have to say this, that I do believe in the importance of consistency and congruency and harmony between ontology, epistemology, and methodology. And the problem that Roy is making, and you both picked up on it in your questions, I don't know if you were very kind, the problem she has is that she has gone around and changed philosophical assumptions without changing her model. When the philosophical assumptions are what the model flows from. Mm -hmm. So she had a adaptation framework based on an adaption from Hilson and she had assumptions, but because her model became outdated because of the influence of the unitary transformative paradigm, she wanted to sound more like a unitary person. And so she puts in words like meaning and energy and cosmology and all this stuff in that. But where does it flow? Where, where is that? Where, where is that within the model, the structure of the model itself and the concepts? It just don't change definitions. Mm -hmm. And so to me, her model now is totally incongruent with her philosophical assumptions. So when, when I'm saying of using nursing classification, I don't see that as a problem in relationship to the ontology and epistemology of nursing as caring. They, because it's not theoretical. Well, it's maybe just, we need a response, it, you know, from our theorists here. It's a dictionary of terms. You know, I think Anne term. gave one response <laughs> previously. So, uh, Sabina, do you have uh, some thoughts? Uh, well, where, where I, I'm stuck back at, the language of clinical reasoning. Um, <clears throat> I guess when I first started realizing that my nursing needed to have a theoretical frame back in 19, when I was an undergraduate student co-majoring in psychology and they had their frames, we didn't have any frame. Um, <laughs> I learned the phrase thinking nursing yeah. And the idea of clinical reasoning turns me off. The word clinical. <laughs> because it's so really. limited. It's so yeah. limited. I don't even Thinking like the word nursing. clinical. No, that's. Yeah, no. I don't like the word. But that's why but the, I call it the, nursing. Where, where oh. the model is going, I think, is very valuable. Mm -hmm. well, and I, I have a lot of things jotted down here, too, that I don't agree with, but that it's going to be fun to talk about. Yes. Uh, we have a. <laughs> have a, 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 a person who is in a participant who has her hand up. And uh, I tell you, I'm not very good at knowing how to access that. So the person who has a hand up for a question, could you please ask the question? And we're coming on almost um, 225 and we, you know, we need to conclude our presentation at 2.30. So uh, could the person who has her hand up uh, communicate um, what she's asking, please. Catherine, were you asking something? Huh? Was it Catherine? Was it Kitty? Yeah. I think everybody else is gone. <laughs> well, oh, no. <laughs> oh, you know, that was Sabina me. had her hand up on That's her it. on her picture. I, oh. I put my hand up a long time ago, but then oh, I went ahead and anyway. <laughs> That's my big fault. Deal. I can't. Well, oh, Kitty, what's your reaction to all this? I, I think it's 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 a very valid way to me of thinking through things. But I, I kind of go back a little bit to what Anne said. I always think about, okay, so what is nursing in there? Like, what is the piece that nursing brings? 
And, you know, because as, as you said, you know, the social worker can be a caregiver, you know, there's, there's different perspectives. And I think the key piece that you, as you were talking about, and D also was that thinking piece. It's how the nurse thinks through this. That's very different from all of the other people that may be doing the same process, but the thinking piece is different based on our education and our training. And so I don't know how you would maybe learn to how to capitalize on, you know, thinking as a nurse and, and how does that's different. And, and maybe some of the, the nursing languages that you've described, Howard, with the Nick and Nock and Nanda might be um, part of that process. I'm not sure. Right. This is my first time to kind of hear this. So, uh, you know. So I do this presentation that I call how to think like a nurse. And it starts with nursing philosophy. Okay, there are our meta paradigm, our paradigms, our conceptual frameworks that inform everything all the way down to our mid range theories, which are derived from our nursing conceptual frameworks to our nursing languages. And so that our nursing languages are all part of this from the most abstract to the most concrete. So how to think nursing, that is what's in the nursing lexicon, that is what is in the nursing basket, because it's the conceptual framework for how you conceptualize our practice methodologies and the fuel that is the engine. The, 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 the nursing process is like the engine, the OPT is the engine, but the fuel that goes into making that engine run is our unique body of knowledge, starting with our philosophy all the way down to our specific in this case, nursing is caring. So nursing as caring is what frames everything that you're doing. So you're just not doing caregiver support like a social worker does it. You're doing it in the context of nursing as caring, which means using all the ways of knowing, grounding it in the six C's, in Myroff's you know, uh, caring ingredients, within the concepts and the philosophy of personhood, that you're doing it all within that context. It's not just caregiver support anymore it's what we call it, but how we deliver it. So to me, the NIC are caring practices. They're our practices. They're not interventions. Interventions is from another paradigm. They're practices that are conceptualized for us within caring as nursing. And how we delivered them, we delivered them within the context of the nursing as caring framework, which means doing it in, a, in, the, in, the, in the purpose of enhancing professionalhood, I mean, personhood and all that. So that that is the substance, the nursing in the model. I think one thing we need to do in nursing is agree to eliminate the word the, because when you said the uh, nursing meta paradigm, I just cringed. Oh. Like what most people think of is Fawcett's old fashioned outdated. Oh, yeah, I've gone and then, you know, uh, what uh, Roy presented last night on, uh, what's his name? I can't think right now. But anyway, there's not one the nursing <laughs> meta paradigm. It, we, we latch on to stuff that makes our life easy. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to have to make our life a little easy now because okay. we're coming to the end of our uh, wonderful uh, circle of caring presentation with Dr. Howard Butcher. And thank you again, Howard, for sharing your knowledge. And, and so next um, and uh, next month, then um, I think that we will invite you again, Howard, oh. if you uh, could, uh, you know, continue. We didn't talk about your first methodology. No, we didn't. You know, so that's another uh, component, you know, that we need to address and, you know, honor uh, from all of your knowledge and, and that kind of thing. So just before you go, uh, Anne, what did you have in mind for Howard to present next month if he's willing to do it again? Whoops, you're muted. Sorry. Sorry, Howard. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, just when he was talking about nursing language, I'd be curious about that. Um, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, you know, and it's just, I knew we didn't have anything scheduled for next month. So I think uh, even a little panel discussion, I, I, 
I'm open to the possibilities. I did mean to. It just struck me in the moment. <laughs> well, I, um, I am very, very interested, Howard, in your method and the approach that you're using. And you and I share that same level of, uh, of um, knowledge about how theory advances, you know, from method itself, and especially within the context of a hermeneutic phenomenological approach, you know. So that is one area, you know, that I would I would like you to uh, present your methodology and uh, and also, you know, again how your student or maybe multiple students are using your method, and and then I mean we could start. If we begin with the, um, you know, the OBT model, I, I don't know if we'll get to your method again. So, so I'm trying to think how to frame this the best way. What are your thoughts? Well, there is, the, if you're ready, there's a presentation that I do want to do. So if I was to present next, the next time, I would start with the OBT as grounded in Karen. So that because I because there'd be probably be people there that one wouldn't have heard that part. So I was right. start. I was start with people had to leave, you know. Right. Uh, yeah. And then I have a presentation that I do that about why we need nursing languages. Um, I think it's pretty powerful, but it's my perspective, uh, starting from a broad perspective, on why we need. And I'm talking about not nursing diagnosis. I'm just talking about. Nick, okay, because I'm a spokesperson for Nick, not for Nock or not for Nanda. I think that actually we thought about dropping Nanda completely out of, you know, we have the NNN, diagnosis, interventions, and outcomes. Well, you could actually go from outcomes right to interventions. You don't need to have a diagnosis. So we've talked about that because the problem, the problems that Nanda presents, but, um, but I don't, I'm not an advocate for Nanda, but I do believe that our Nick and Knock are things that really do enhance practice for multiple ways. And I'd like to share that knowledge because I don't th think that it's used here at FAU. Um, and they're using language that doesn't translate into anything outside of the person who's coming up with what it is that they're choosing to do. You'll have to frame that in, uh, in caring science, in a caring science perspective. Uh, well, number one, to fit with this series, but right. well, number but two, because you, uh, like I said before, people grab onto stuff that's easy without thinking about the frame. Right. So, <laughs> so you'll well, have to teach us to frame Nick and Nock. Right. So but with going back to the model, time. going back to the model, the nursing interventions are the responses, the, the responses to calls for nurturing. They're not interventions. Nick are the responses, the nursing responses, the calls for nurturing. They're not interventions. Um, so it's, a, and that's what I have in the model. If you look at the, the diagram where the decision-making goes, okay, if we go back to the... What I'm saying is you have to teach people how to use a nursing framework with the model. R right, right. <laughs> and just just one comment on that. Oops. I just put I put that up there so you can see that Nick, I have it in parentheses there, but they're not interventions, they're Karen responses. Yeah, I, I, I know you've done the work, but you, in presenting, a focus has to be on helping people translate what they know, <clears throat> the framework that they bring, which is largely medical <coughs> model. Right. Nursing diagnosis. I got you. I got you. Yeah. yeah, you know better than I, I do. I, <laughs> I guess I guess this meeting's over, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what I think we need to do. Pardon? The group of the group of us should go somewhere and just this is what Martha used to do. They used to go out to a club or something and have drinks and they would talk unitary science. So why couldn't we, the, the four of us, just go out and talk about this? And we probably would come up with a refine or do develop a, maybe a totally <laughs> new model, but something that 
can use a, they can be used as a guide for practice, but we should have dialogue about it. I was thinking while you were presenting that we should have, remember those old uh, things in nursing science quarterly, the dialogues? Yeah. I think we should have a dialogue that's videoed and then made available not only for our own continued learning and development, but for other people to tap into and contribute their ideas. That would be a wonderful initiative through the Institute. Yes, it would. That would be a wonderful initiative through the Institute. Just one thing I was gonna say is, Howard, for at FAU in the College of Nursing, the curriculum has never been framed around nursing as caring. And that was pretty intentional um, in that I didn't want to force a viewpoint on everybody as a theory. However, it was always the intention that the curriculum be solidly grounded in caring science from a, you know, a viewpoint. So I think going back maybe to what Savina said, if we can present this just it's a broad framework, but it is about caring. And then our programs are about evolving caring scholars. But right. you can, uh, in teaching us to use the framework, give examples from Watson or mm -hmm. you know other caring theorists, not just nursing as caring. So that again, to continue the idea that nursing as caring is not imposed upon the Mm -hmm. curriculum nor the faculty at FAU. It's one of the mm -hmm. of the broad uh, nursing frameworks. I could do. Well, we do, we you know, have the time. nursing philosophy, right, with the Broach and Mira, you know, yeah. that grounds the right. programs and, uh, you know, but I, I like that idea, Sabina, you know, whereby, um, you know, who's ever presenting or listening, you know, can look at the broadness of, of caring <laughs> theories. But, you know, um, I think your theory, definitely nursing is caring is significant in the context of, of Howard's presentation and also at our university, you know, at FAU. I could frame, I could use the OPT and put Watson in there and frame it all around that. But lining, but lining or Slip yeah. in several to give, you know. To I need more time to idea. do those. <laughs> <laughs> so, or even Dolores God, the late Dolores Oh, oh my God, God you yes. Know, I can see some of her ideas in that model and different things like that. So, yeah, that um, would be great. Middle yeah. range stuff like Chris Swanson and Nino's yeah. work. And, like, remember what, I guess we still have the course where you present all the or as many caring theories as possible within a particular course. I don't know. Do they still have a course like that? I don't know. I, I, do that. I, yeah. I used to love to teach that and compare and contrast. And the students would compare and contrast. It was wonderful. I do, know. Yeah, I do that in 68 on 6110. Oh, that that needs to be in the very first undergraduate nursing course. Uh, and then, yeah, this is the, I'm not, yeah, this is at the graduate level. I'm not, yeah. I don't know what's um, going on at the undergraduate level. Yeah, so, well, uh, since we're getting on here, um, Howard, would you mind um, giving us a title? You know, how uh -oh. you're- let, Yeah, let me, I'll do that. <laughs> looking now, at I do this. want you to know that even though I'm, so you, you can see my passion, right? But yes, please, you have please a know, G, Ann, and Savina, you are my teachers. You're my mentors. You're my I am. I am not fixed. I. I am. I'm like a sponge, you know. And so I am open to whatever revisions or I want to. You know. I. I said that at the beginning. I'm open for critique. So I don't want you to think that I'm fixed in the what I presented. Um, everything is always evolving and changing. I. I presented this because I knew that I was going to get feedback, and I want feedback. Okay, I want that. I want this. I want this to be ours. Ours. Let's have, let's uh, let's um, schedule a dialogue, maybe an informal dialogue, and then moving to a more public dialogue. How about that? Uh, so, 
have a informal one before we have the next circle of caring. Is that not what necessarily? Oh. Uh, I don't know. Whatever Howard wants to do. Because uh -huh. you know, I get invitations to speak all over the place, and, and I want to be representing what you want to be represented. If I'm if I'm not, not putting something out there that that you that there's a better way of saying things in this diagram in this model than what's in there now. Well, let's just I, have I a private uh, dialogue about nursing is caring. Okay. In the model, and that's separate from what you're going to present next month. Okay. Okay. That's for our for and, my and, growth and so, Anne's growth, the model's growth, the theory's growth, and your growth. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, I'm excited and I appreciate the openness and throwing this out there for us to mull over. I just, I'm very excited. So I'd like to meet as soon as we can. <laughs> okay, so I'll- What are you doing at three o'clock? <laughs> uh, so you wanna talk about just like the OPT model as it's out there published, the OPT model itself. No, as, as you've reinterpreted oh, okay. it, okay. The nursing is caring. Okay. Okay, so we have two things. So Anne and Sabina, you'll set up a meeting with uh, Howard for uh, your own uh, dialogue. And then uh, Howard, you will uh, determine what you want to present next time for the circle of caring. Right. Okay. And I'll, send, yeah, and I'll send these slides out to you guys so you can look. That's so you great. Can copy. So. I screenshot most of them, but I appreciate the whole slide deck. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank anyway, you. this, this has been. I was sweating. I was sweating. <laughs> Howard, I can see your passion. It's oh yeah, I was sweating. <laughs> but it was wonderful, and again, thank you for all of the scholarship and and you know the way in which you synopsize everything and present that to us, and also Anne and Sabina, thank you for also your contribution. Uh, to this and it's been wonderful so and wouldn't it be great d if we could get together and just sit somewhere and have a glass of wine yeah. like well, we're all in Boca or well uh, you know and you're coming for the um excellence in caring aren't you are you coming for that meeting you know yeah. where aren't we supposed to have a guest and oh i i'm in. gonna be on i'll be on um zoom for that but those that are that live in the Boca area will be there in person. I see, I see. But then the AB, ABI or the ABI um, uh, Summer Academy. Or the Summer, Summer Academy. Yeah, you'll, will you? Oh. Right, we'll be there 